Okay, cool. <clears throat> well, thank you, every uh, thank you, Pedro, for inviting us. And uh, I'm going to speak about a project that I've been working on for the last few years. So, uh, the Skullcracker Suite is the name of a long-term artistic research project I've been working on since about 2016, uh, looking at processes of uh, decolonization in British Columbia since the 1970s from a very particular optic. The project has its roots in a course I taught at Emily Carr University of Art and Design in 2000, and that course was called the Sacred Revolution. And really the book was, the, that, that course was a summer school course and it was based on Georges Bataille's writing, the French surrealist philosopher. And this is the book that was really important for that. Now, just to very, if you're not familiar with Georges Bataille, this is the first of three volumes he wrote on something called general economy, which is basically the idea that instead of thinking about uh, scarcity, necessity, need and production, we should think about economies in terms of excess, expenditure and waste. And when we think about economies in those terms, we can overturn classical economics. That's the basic idea. And one chapter of this book was dedicated to this thing called the potlatch. Okay, so potlatch, very briefly, is a gift-giving and name-conferring ritual process that takes place uh, amongst first pe the first peoples of the Pacific Northwest coast of Canada and the USA. And they happen ceremonial. Every time someone gets married or christened or there's a name change, uh, these ceremonies take place, and what happens is the, the chief of the, of the group or the community is expected to accumulate a great amount of wealth, and when everyone comes to that event, they give that wealth away. So honour is conferred not on those who have the most wealth, but on those who can give the most away. So it's a great example of what Georges Bataille called non-productive expenditure, which, is, which was his big idea. He was looking for ways of thinking economics which weren't individualistic, acquisitive, and capitalist. And Potlatch was for him a great example of that. Um, now, when I taught that course in Canada, I'd assumed that the Potlatch had ended. Uh, it turns out that, in fact, Potlatch had still been going on. Potlatch was banned by the colonial authorities in 1885, and the ban was lifted in 1951. But in 2000, when I taught that course at Emily Carr, nobody knew, my colleagues, that potlatching had, had continued going on. Well, it had actually never stopped. I say the potlatch never ended. Uh, and I got an email in 2012 from a, someone who'd been on that course, a guy called Steve Calvert, a friend and a, so, and a former student, who said, I'm in Alert Bay. I've been documenting potlatch ceremonies. You should come. Alert Bay is up in British Columbia on the, up the Sunshine Coast. This is a shot by uh, one of... Steve's photographs of Bo Dick, the great First Nations artist who sadly died last year, just before he, he gave a, a world healing ceremony at Documenta uh, in Athens. This is Bo's potlatch ceremony. Bo here uh, is carrying a traditional potlatch copper. The potlatch coppers are, have incredible value accrued to them. Every time a potlatch copper is exchanged at a ceremony or a potlatch, it accrues all the value of everything else that's been exchanged. So they're hugely important symbolic entities, which are believed to be beings and personalities in their own right. Um, Bo became kind of famous or more known in 2012 and 2013 when he led two caravans of protesters protesting the Canadian government's refusal to recognize indigenous treaty rights. And they did two copper breaking ceremonies, one uh, in Victoria and one in Ottawa. To break a copper is to literally do violence to a being to do a kind of sacrificial act. And this was a, a shaming gesture to the Canadian authorities. Steve had been documenting these events and Bo was made it clear that he wanted the world to know about the potlatch. He wanted people to know that the potlatch was still alive and, and going on and hadn't in fact ended. Bo is also was a member of a, a secret society called the Hamatsa. And they're, what they do through the, the right of the Hamatsa is to enact the transition from the man-eater the voracious cannibal who can't stop eating, into the person who knows how to curb their appetite. Curbing your appetite is a fundamental part of the ritual of the Hamatsa. I bring that up because the name of the Skullcracker Suite, uh, it comes after one of the giant cannibal birds uh, who are the consorts of uh, Baxbaxwalanuksiwe, the cannibal at the north end of the world from uh, Kwakwakwiak mythology, who crack the skulls of humans to eat their brains. So this is Hohok, uh, with the large, uh, the large beak on the right, photographed by Edward Curtis. I'm sure you're familiar with the photographs and work of Edward S. Curtis. If you're not, look at Edward S. Curtis. He, he made one of the first ethnographic fictions called uh, uh, In the Land of the Headhunters about the Kwakwakwiak, which is now used by Kwakwakwiak communities to uh, recreate their own ritual dances and practices because his documentation was so 
uh, kind of accurate, relatively speaking. So we had this idea that there's gifting, presents, Christmas, winter ceremonials. That reminded us, of course, the Nutcracker Suite, and also the traditions of people like Krampus, which is a Central European Christmas tradition of a kind of ghoulish monster which comes and carries kids away at Christmas if they've been, if they've been you know, not good, etc. So these more sinister sides of the Christmas ceremonials. And we came up with this idea called uh, the Skullcracker Suite. This is a drawing that myself and Stephanie Moran, who I'm working with on this project, drew in the, uh, 2015, which came the basis for what we've been doing. Um, another important work is uh, Eduardo Viveros de Castro's Cannibal Metaphysics, for reasons that are quite kind of obvious. But de Castro talked about the uh, talked about the task of ethnography being the permanent decolonization of thought, and this book is where he puts that idea forward. To just simplify the idea of cannibal metaphysics, man may be a wolf to man, that's Thomas Hobbes, but a wolf is a person to a wolf. That, in essence, is kind of what cannibal metaphysics is about. Bataille said, imminence is given when one animal eats another, and it is always a fellow creature that is eaten. Now, what cannibal metaphysics is about is a cosmological worldview where the things that you eat are your kin, that kinship co is conferred on those things we depend on for our existence. It's a different way of thinking uh, the world of predation. It's also a different way of thinking the idea of personhood. I taught at Emily Carrigan in 2016, and, and this is so this is quite a while after I'd first taught there. By that time, there were indigenous students and students of mixed heritage who were talking about decolonizing the curriculum. And I began to question my own presence. Like, why was a white European teaching about potlatch in British Columbia to, in, to potentially, well, there, was, there were indigenous artists in, the, in my class. Sunny Asu, as a, a First Nations artist, was in the, that seminar. Right, so, and yet, so what was I doing there talking about potlatch? How does the knowledge that I know about, which is basically critical theory, Marxist, feminist, psychoanalytic, post-colonial, queer theory, right, but it's still a white European speaking to indigenous and mixed heritage students, telling them about decolonization. This is a big challenge, challenge to me. So this is a very important work for the project. I'll just read this out, because this is what I felt I was, I was facing. The easy adoption of this decolonizing discourse by educational advocacy and scholarship, evidenced by the increasing calls to decolonize our schools or use decolonizing methods or to decolonize student thinking, turns decolonization into a metaphor. The metaphorization of decolonization makes possible a set of evasions or settler moves to innocence that problematically attempt to reconcile settler guilt and complicity and rescue, rescue settler futurity. So I was very conscious to, be even, to even be a white European engaging with the discourse of decolonization might be perpetuating this idea of decolonization as a metaphor. In my attempt to get around that, I decided to, following an earlier project I'd worked on, adopt the persona of the science fiction writer Philip K. Dick. So this is me as Philip K. Dick at the Museum of Anthropology in British Columbia, where he had visited in 1972 to speak at a science fiction conference. Uh, and he did this famous talk called The Android and the Human, where he mapped out the Blade Runner scenario. You know, you can't tell the difference between simulants and real people. He had a nervous breakdown. Uh, and after that nervous breakdown, he ended up in a First Nations rehab clinic. So this was the premise and the conceit for this way of getting into the question of decolonization through Philip K. Dick and his science fictional colonization narratives. So we treated British Columbia like what um, Dick would call an off-world colony. Has anybody seen Blade Runner? Well, you remember at the beginning of Blade Runner when the thing is flying around, it's saying, a new life awaits you in the off-world colonies. Well, for me, British Columbia was like an off-world colony for Brits. So we played on this idea that the empire had never ended, which was one of Philip Dick's ideas that in fact Philip K. Dick had a vision in 1974 that the Roman Empire was still intact in California and that we were living in its black eye in prison and that the empire had never ended. And our Canadian colleagues, many of them didn't realize that Canada is still ruled uh, by the Queen of England. So we called this first phase of the project BC time slip, the empire never ended. So we set up a special investigation room investigating Philip K. Dick's time in British Columbia in Dynamo Art Space. This is um, the journal uh, ex, uh, out front, the Ex Calais Journal. I did an interview with David Burner, the founder of Ex Calais, how we'd set that up with uh, ex cons from the BC Pen, who were largely First Nations. This group used extreme 
psychodrama, therapy to cure addiction and to, for rehab. So what they do, they call it the game, and everybody was be, would be involved in that. So the conceit would be that um, Philip K. Dick could have met First Nations people in this rehab clinic in Vancouver in the 1970s. Anyway, so I did a series of photospheres. This is me as Dick in uh, the Museum of Anthropology looking at Hamatsa regalia. We did a various set of uh, filming it around and about British Columbia, uh, putting various fly posting up, um, and did a series of lectures in, in, in the studio. One of the key images that is in Dick's mind is the Pisces, the ichthys symbol, became hugely important for him. The, secret, the symbol of the secret Christians in the Roman Empire who had to use the symbol of the fish to hide their Christian beliefs. Um, he ha kept having visions of the ichthys symbol, and this is where the idea of the ichthys being swallowed by a giant whale in a constellation called uh, Fommelhout. This is when I got to know about Bo Dick's work, and this is an image of Bo's called Devoured by Consumerism from 2016, uh, which is his commentary on the way in which consumerism, and particularly the mass media, consume the lives of people. So this is an image that coincidentally mapped onto this uh, huge mouth eating the fish, the cannibal metaphysics, the metaphysics of predation, and mouths are hugely important in Kwakwakwia mythology. Um, from our, this connection, we were invited to a potluck ceremony by Bo Dick to Chief Alan Hunt. It was inaug his inaugural potluck in Fort Rupert in British Columbia. And this is the longhouse in Fort Rupert. So I just want to show you a bit of what happened. Alan invited us to document the entire potluck. This was a 14-hour ceremony that included a full Hamatta initiation. This is Jaden, Chief Alan Hunt's uh, brother, being initiated in the, into the Hamatsa secret society. This is Bo Dick on the right, who is the master of ceremonies for most of the uh, events that take place, an incredibly charismatic, powerful figure. Um, this is Hohok, or Hox Hock, the cannibal bird. And um, these are transformation masks uh, that, that were made specifically for the, the ceremony. And finally, just to end what I've been doing, I wrote a catalogue essay for Bo's posthumous show, which is happening at the White Columns Gallery in New York right now, called Devoured by Consumerism. And if you go to my website, you can get the essay uh, from my website. And that's it. Thank you. Sorry for being a bit compressed.